I have a cold, so this is very helpful. <clears throat> um, like Tyler said, uh, welcome to Wild Yeast 101. Um, I'm going to teach you how to catch wild yeast, and you don't have to be a scientist, and you don't need special equipment. Basically, if you know how to make a yeast starter, you can catch wild yeast. <clears throat> um, So let's talk first what is wild yeast. A lot of beers are sold and marketed as wild when they contain Britannomyces. Um, but if you bought that Britannomyces from a lab, um, it, is it really wild? You know it's pretty much how it's going to behave, what flavors it's going to give you. So um, my very complicated definition is wild yeast came from the wild. Uh, <laughs> That's good. And uh, one thing to note, wild yeast does not have to equal sour beer. It doesn't even have to equal funky beer. Um, uh, the sample that you guys got here at the beginning is just uh, an ordinary bitter um, with a wild yeast that I got from a date that came from Mexico. And uh, it just makes kind of a fruity Englishy sort of flavors and uh, so ordinary bit. Um, and sorry, neither of the samples today are sour and ready because I did not have enough time to make a beer for you. So I apologize. Um, let's talk about sources here. Actually, that's a picture of the date. Uh, we bought a bunch of them at the grocery store and I threw them in the starter and now you're picking the yeast. So. Um, uh, if you're looking to get like a localized terroir or maybe uh, capture something from a certain place that you went to, um, a really good source uh, is fruit, obviously, uh, like this date. Um, especially like if you want something that's like local to your home brewery. So fruit you grow yourself raspberries, blackberries, uh, even apples and plums and stuff like that are great sources. Um, uh, grapes are another good source. Also, uh, fresh pressed, unpasteurized cider. Go to an orchard and get some unpasteurized cider and just let it ferment itself and you'll have some wild yeast from it. Store-bought is also okay. Uh, like I said, I bought this at the grocery store. Um, just try to get organic if you can, just so it doesn't have any weird chemicals on it that could harm the yeast. Uh, don't get irradiated, because that will not work. Let's see. Uh, vegetables are another source, um, better source for bacteria. Um, when you think about like sauerkraut, you just chop up cabbage and put salt on it, and that ferments itself uh, with lactobacteria. Um, but a really good vegetable, if you're especially looking for yeast, is uh, ginger, and also similar to ginger, turmeric root, and the langle. Um, actually, our host to a whole bunch of uh, great microbes, uh, yeast, rat, lacto, and also uh, some yeast and molds. Um, but we're not going to talk about mold today, other than how it's generally bad. Another source is flowers, uh, so if you want to go um, source something right now, there's not really much fruit around, but there are uh, fruit trees are in bloom, starting to bloom. Um, I recommend edible flowers, because you're going to eventually be drinking it, so don't use lilies for something that is poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another good source is raw honey. Um, actually, can we get the second one coming around? Sorry. <clears throat> um, um, people think that honey is antibacterial, which it is to sort of. Uh, it's antibacterial in the same way that when you go to the store and buy a sack of sugar and leave it in your pantry for 50 years, it never rots. Uh, the sugar concentration is so high 
um, that nothing can really get going. All the uh, liquid gets, just gets sucked out of any microbes that are in it. Hygroscopic. Um, yeah. But um, that doesn't actually necessarily kill those microbes. They're just waiting for a more favorable environment for that water, uh, sugar to get diluted down with water. So uh, raw honey is a great source. Um, the sample that's coming around uh, is with my wild abbey yeast that I got off of uh, my neighbor's on pasture his honey, and it gives it a really nice uh, sort of abbey style bubblegum clove flavors. Uh, both of these beers were made from the same port. I just split the batch, so this is pseudo abbey single, I guess. Hey Matt. Yeah. Uh, let me know if there's going to be two wild beers and our booth that have a Okay. Yeah, uh, at our booth tonight, uh, Cascadia Brewers Alliance, we're going to have two beers that came uh, from, uh, yeast came from flowers. Um, I helped Scott harvest, so come check it out. Um, another source, which is a little funkier, is insects. Um, <laughs> Interesting story about uh, this. This is a queen wasp. And um, one morning I saw an article somebody had posted online about some scientists were wondering how does Saccharomyces cerevisiae survive winter because Saccharomyces likes to die and winter is cold. Um, and they found out that it overwinters in the stomach of queen wasps. Uh, and then she passes it on to her offspring and goes back out into the wild. And then that afternoon, I'm going down to my smoker to put some meat in for the first time this season. And I pull the cover off in the recess of the door handle. There's this wasp curled up. And that evening, I had to make starters, actually, to make these beers. So I'm like, this is a sign from God. She's going in a starter. Um, <laughs> and uh, she, she fermented um, uh, quite vigorously. I haven't used her in a beer yet, no, so. Uh, tell the story about the jar part. <laughs> what, oh yeah, I just put her in a jar and then I brought her inside and she woke up and was pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well what do I do now? I got an angry yeast, or an angry wasp in a jar. <laughs> How do I get her into a start? So I shook the hell out of her. And I stunned her and then I put her in a <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not vegan. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and finally, open air did another source. Um, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with uh, how lambic, uh, lambic, I should say, and uh, Flanders are usually uh, the hot works poured into a cool ship. They let uh, they have the windows open, let it cool off overnight, let cold air from outside blow in, slowly cool it. Uh, wart off and also whatever blows in, lands in the wart, inoculates it, and they let that ferment. Um, I haven't done that a whole lot. Um, my experience with it and reading about it, often it is a good way to grow mold. So if you want mold, um, <laughs> go for it. But um, I have done it once and it was successful, so it's not impossible. It's just a matter of doing it right, I guess. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to actually how do you capture it. So you have your source. Hang on. This paper is being a dick. All right. <laughs> um, so you have your source, and how do you get the yeast off of that source so you can put it in your beer? Um, it boils down to uh, making a starter and adding your source. Um, it's not quite the same as making a yeast starter where you put yeast in and then, you know, slurry it up and spin it. Um, I'm going to talk about if you just want to capture yeast and not bacteria. Um, and when I say just yeast, that includes Britannomyces. Um, make a hopped starter. So just throw, I usually just throw like a handful of hops into the starter when I'm boiling it. You don't need to shoot for any IBU. Uh, level um, hops inhibit lactobacteria uh, even as a dry hop. That's why they dry hopped IPA descended. Yeah. For a target gravity when you're trying to capture? 
Yeah, um, actually, um, one thing, uh, especially for your starter, um, usually around 10.30, um, the reason for this is that when it, when it does ferment out, you want it to end up above 2% ABV, and that's to kill enteric bacteria that could be in there. Um, enteric will make uh, vomit and fecal and feet aromas and flavors, so you don't really want that. Uh, Brett can do some stuff with that, um, but it's better to avoid. Um, I also add a bit of nutrient to my starters just to give the yeast a little something extra to chew on. And then shake and otherwise oxygenate your starter. Um, and then add your source if you're doing the open air uh, inoculation. Generally, um, what I'd suggest is put it into some sort of shallow bowl, um, cover it with like a cheesecloth or something to keep bugs out or don't if you want bugs. Um, set it out somewhere, uh, at least three or four hours, um, not more than 24 hours. I would recommend doing a shorter time period rather than longer. I think the longer you're more likely to catch mold. Uh, just because of that oxygen exposure. And then uh, affix an airlock to your starter, which is different than what you would do with a regular starter. Um, the reason for this um, is to inhibit the growth of mold, generally requires oxygen, and also acetic acid bacteria requires oxygen. Um, so for this initial starter, um, just put an airlock on it, don't stir or aerate it. Um, and then wait patiently um, because what you're pitching into that starter is a very, very, very small amount of yeast. Um, I've had to wait uh, upwards of a week sometimes before I saw any sign of fermentation. So just kind of set it aside and go about your business and then take a look later. Um, if you do want to catch both yeast and bacteria, then obviously uh, don't hop the starter. Um, again, make sure that it's a high enough gravity around 1.030 so that you get that 2% alcohol to kill enteric. Um, nutrient in, etc. Then add your source and then uh, for this you would cover it with oil and airy um, to help get that bacteria growing. Um, the thing to keep in mind for if you're trying to catch yeast and bacteria is to try to keep your starter cooler in the low 60s Fahrenheit. Uh, the reason for this is uh, it gives that, the yeast a chance to get going against the uh, fast growing bacteria. <coughs> bacteria likes to grow really quickly um, and it grows even quicker at warmer temperatures. So like if you're familiar with kettle, kettle souring, you usually do that at like 115. 120 degrees. So, cooler will slow the bacteria down. It won't stop it. Uh, let the yeast go, so they can be friends instead of enemies. And then again, wait patiently. Forever. So, yeah. what is it that you have in this? Uh, these are. This is some um, juniper berries and uh, branches as well. Um, and I actually, I picked these up uh, in, in the desert of Sedona, high desert. And uh, one of my wild beasts uh, came from this. It's got bread and it's amazing and wonderful. And I didn't bring a sample for you, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about some safety considerations. Um, this is uh, some delicious mold that I grew on the top of one. Um, it had been growing for some time, it was in the fridge. Um, yep. Some nasty things can potentially grow in this first starter that can make you ill. Um, I know, I'm sure you've heard that nothing, no human pathogens can grow in beer, nothing that can make you sick, um, even though some things could taste awful. Um, that's true for beer uh, because it has alcohol and it is a little lower pH after the fermentation. Uh, it's not necessarily true for wort. Um, some things that you can do to help uh, 
mitigate some of this um, is pre-lower your the pH of your starter to 4.5 or less to inhibit E. coli. Um, generally, wort is around 5 pH, so you don't have to bring it down that much. Um, um, that'll also help inhibit botulism, which is good. Um, you could also fortify your wort to about 4% before you even add your source by uh, adding neutral spirit like vodka to it. Um, this will uh, also inhibit E. coli uh, and outright kill the enteric bacteria right away. Um, another thing to do is keep that, uh, this initial starter for at least a month at room temperature. Um, I guess they've done some studies and they found that E. coli growing in wort uh, after a month at room temperature, it's all dead. So, another thing you could do. Um, I've actually not done any of that, other than maybe the month thing, just because I'm lazy, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, some weird things can grow in it, so if you are like immunosuppressed for whatever reason, maybe you should just stick to lab yeast, and it might be better. Um, but look, so did you catch anything good? Um, now that you've got your starter, you got your source in there, uh, did it ferment? Um, obviously, if it didn't ferment, then maybe you didn't catch anything, or who knows. Um, but generally, after a while, it will form a croissant on top of your starter. Um, and if it did ferment, how does it smell? Does it smell good, or does it smell like barf? Um, if it smells like um, vomit or fecal or feet, um, I would just recommend dumping it and starting over um, rather than trying to like cook something out of there. It's not worth it. Um, so if it smells good, then crash it, uh, decant the liquid off the top of the yeast cake and give it a taste. Uh, how does it taste? Um, if it tastes good and it smells good, then you probably got something good. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Um, if it tastes bad, toss it and start over. Um, if it grew mold, then toss it and start over. Uh, some molds aren't harmful, but I don't know how to tell which ones are harmful and which ones aren't, so I just toss it. How many yeast do we have to try before we get it? Uh, I think my failure rate is less than 50%, really, so. I've tried twice. The first one was the mold, the second one got yeast. first one was raspberries, the second one was uh, Russian sage, which is a lavender type of bush. So. Yeah, and uh, you probably heard me just say, uh, dump it and start over like five times. Um, you can make more than one at a time if you got a bunch of fruit. You can make like three or four, and maybe one will go bad, but maybe the other one won't. So that's the thing you can do if you don't want to like, you like, well, shit, now I have to start all over, so. A good way is to just, if you're going to be making a session, session style beer, go ahead and up your, up your batch size by a gallon, and then pull a gallon of water off and just, uh, Use the mason jars, and and you'll get a whole bunch of starters, and you can just throw whatever you want in all of them, and see what you can come up with. It, it, it allows you to do it without taking extra time to make starters. You just use your wort from a low gravity beer. Yeah, exactly. That's a great idea. Um, so if you got something good, now what? Step it up. Um, this time, uh, make it like a normal starter. Uh, you can aerate it, put it on your stir plate, what have you. I just shake it. Um, and then, make beer. <laughs> um, usually I'll just do like a kind of a basic saison recipe to try on my wild yeast, but if, uh, if what you tasted and smelled uh, is pointing you in another direction, uh, let that yeast determine the style that you want to brew for the first time with that yeast. Um, yeah, so if it's fruity, maybe make a British style or American pale ale or something like that. 
Uh, if it's spicy or bready, uh, Saison farmhouse ales, of course. Uh, bubblegum clove, uh, make a wit or an abbey style beer. Um, and if you want the full bacteria route, get sour, make a goza or Berliner Weisse. Um, I would shy away from heavily hot uh, or even heavily malted styles for this first batch, just so you can really taste that yeast character. Um, and the fermentation may be long um, with commercial yeast. Fermentation is usually about a week or so. Uh, with my wild yeasts, uh, I usually leave them at least two weeks, if not an entire month, depending. They're, they're a little bit slower, um, but they seem to get the job done. Um, when it seems like it's done, when it's down to the gravity that you want it, that you expect it to finish at, or probably lower, um, what I'll do is I'll rack a gallon into a jug stick an airlock on it and just put it away in the corner somewhere and then I'll taste it in like six months just to see if Britannomyces was there and started expressing itself or doing anything or if the yeast itself just started doing something weird. See what happens long term. Um, yeah, the, the first time I did that, I was like really regretting not letting the whole thing go <laughs> for six months because it was amazing. Um, so what was the difference, though? <laughs> um, initially, the one that I was talking about had like it was very clovey, almost like half a bison clovey. It wasn't a banana. Um, it was really good, and then it just went brett, and it was like funky and barnyardy and just amazing. <laughs> and I was like, I only have a So I immediately made some more. <laughs> nice. Is that what's in the saison uh, Actually, no. That's the one from the from the juniper berries. Um, I recommend kegging just because you don't know if there's some bread in there or something that's going to like attenuate it down to um, below one. Um, just for bottle exploding reasons, uh, you don't want to get injured or possibly killed uh, doing this. Um, if you can't keg, um, bottle it, let it condition, make sure it's carbonated and then put it in the fridge to just slow that down um, but still be careful because I have put uh, just yeast cakes in the fridge in jars and uh, they're like some of them carbonate in the fridge like it doesn't care so it takes a while but so it'll slow it down but it won't necessarily stop it might but you don't know Um, save the slurry. As you, like I was just saying, you can see this middle one. Uh, as I opened that, it just totally foamed out and like went nuts. And it had been in the fridge for about a month or two. So, um, what I do is I just, uh, after I rack the beer off of the yeast cake, I just swirl it around and dump it into a jar and throw the jar in the fridge. Uh, put a label on that jar, or you will forget what it is. <laughs> and then, yeah, I have at least three mystery jars in my fridge. <laughs> um, and then when I want to use that yeast again, I'll make a new starter. I'll take the jar and just take a scoop out, put it in the starter, and build it up from there. Uh, that way I have like that first generation that I can keep going to. I know there's still some shift in the fridge probably uh, but it keeps in that first generation and um, what Scott asked me before how long can you keep it in the fridge I have one jar that's been in my fridge for three years and uh, I still get yeast out of it it takes a lot longer for that first starter to come get going but uh, it's still alive so. <laughs> Uh, periodic nutrition or no. just leave it I think I think um, with that one I did add a little bit of work to it at one point just because uh, it got down to the point where there was more cake than there was liquid on top and I didn't want that just to be exposed but otherwise no that's uh, just a bar jar for your old 
three years old now. So now what? Uh, make amazing beers and I know what that means. <laughs> send me some samples. What do you do? I'd love to taste them. Um, if you want to get more scientific, um, you don't have to, but since we're all brewers, we all know that the rabbit hole keeps going forever. Um, you can start by streaking plates to isolate uh, an individual yeast, because what you have kept caught is a culture, not a strain. Um, you can also learn how to make slams uh, for storing better storage, but, uh, you know, three years. Um, and some more resources to take a look at. Um, you're probably familiar with madfermentationist.com, his blog. Uh, he does a lot of mixed fermentation, uh, wild yeast, and uh, all around weird and crazy beers. So it's a really good blog. He also recently wrote a book called American Sour Beers that I cannot recommend highly enough. It is packed with amazing, wonderful information. Um, about this very topic. Um, also, milkthefunk.com. It is a, a website, and also, they also have a, a Facebook group, uh, which I cannot recommend highly enough. It made my Facebook feed actually useful. Um, it's just full of really intelligent people doing really crazy beer experiments, and they're always happy to uh, answer questions and tell you about some amazing cool stuff. Also on their website, milkthefunk.com, they have a wiki that is full of awesome information. Um, additionally, uh, the yeast book, I think Jamil Zanishev and Chris White is a great resource. Um, it's pretty science -y and technical, but it is very good. And the Wild Brews book by Jeff Sparrow, that one deals more with making of Lambic and Flanders, red and brown, uh, but also a great book uh, where he talks about kind of how fermentation works in those beers. And that's it, thank you. Um, like I said, I'm Matt Svon. I also have a blog at mutedog.beer. Yes, that is a real website. <laughs> um, and let me know if you have any questions. Do you make these special reserved samples that you take out the field and they have you back in the house for days or a week or um, moist towels or do you like, try to preserve them in any way? I haven't really done anything where I've had to, to do that. Okay. I think what he means is when you get a branch off a juniper tree. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, right. So, the juniper one that I brought back from Arizona, uh, we just put it. It was kind of uh, spur of the moment harvesting, and we just put it in a plastic bag and tied it shut and brought it home with us. Uh, so it wasn't like super sanitary or anything. I would recommend you know trying to have some sort of sanitized something to put it in, uh, and then just whenever you can, as soon as you can. I guess you can put it in the fridge or something to keep it from rotting if it's like a really sugary fruit or something like that. Yeah. I have not. Uh, that would be interesting to try. Okay. I just want to confirm that the uh, the beer samples that you poured for us today and those were from cultures that you gathered, yeah, not from isolated. Strangers. No, these are not isolated. These are cultures. I have not done any plate streaking, and I've had the equipment for to do it for like a year and a half, and I just haven't gotten around to it. How big is your initial start? Um, it's usually about 500 milliliters. It's not very big. Is there anything you can do to minimize the chance of getting mold while you're collecting your samples? Hmm. As far as the idea of yeah, I don't, I don't here, like a, a darker, damper area, I would think maybe if you could be out in the sun. Something that's a little bit more sun dried, maybe less the chance. The stuff I've heard mm -hmm. is to try to avoid oxygen. Yeah, obviously to avoid oxygen. So that's why you would, you could 
uh, airlock it and don't marry. Okay. Yeah. Is there certain times in the year that it's better to be collecting samples, like versus fall and spring? Supposedly, the summer is not good. Um, like lamb, lamb beef brewers don't brew in the summer because they get too sour. Um, you're more likely to get lacto because it's warmer. Um, so they they brew in fall and winter. Um, as far as for like for collecting fruit or whatever, just whenever it's in season, whenever it's ripe. What time of year do you collect? Do you remember? I think it was like the middle of summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And my, the raspberry one that I had turned to mold, that was in, that was in uh, September or October at the end of raspberry season. It was just a few raspberries left. Like, uh, well, I took classes at Clark College in botany. And so I know about between... Uh, now in May, a lot of the wildflowers are going to be coming off, and some are edible and some are not. So I was wondering if that would be a good time to like um, yeah, collect things like, you know, blue camas is more ed an edible plant out here in the forage area to collect a uh, source from that. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. and I think just when you think about it, the common sense tells me that if you want to collect off the fruit, you would do it during harvest season, obviously. If you want to collect off the flowers, you want to do it when the insects are the most active, mm -hmm. or the hummingbirds are the most active, because that's when the most sugar and stuff is available to them, mm -hmm. or whatever they're, when they, you know, when they're gathering the pollen and all that. So they're carrying stuff in and out, so that's when it has the most yeast, so you know, at the peak of the flowering of that particular plant is probably the best time. But it also is the time when there's probably a lot of mold available too. So, um, yeah. What about using like a preserving agent, something that has that that may help the shard? You could try that. But generally, the reason why potassium metabisulfite works as a sanitizer is that wild yeasts, or cultivated yeasts, are resistant to it, but wild yeasts are not. So I don't recommend that. I do recommend using that to sanitize your equipment if you want to make a clean beer after you've used your wild yeast or something like that. Uh, it works really well. I've never had any cross contamination. So. Also, I don't recommend using strawberries because they seem to like rot if you look at them sideways. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious about just uh, more information in general about your experience with the level of attenuation you achieved. Uh, the different styles of beers you selected from the yeast that you gathered. Are you doing anything to manipulate the uh, fermentation process to get the results that you brought to share with us today? Or <laughs> um, well, the, the second sample that yeast uh, seems to uh, be a honey badger. Uh, I put it into some wort that I uh, mashed at 158 and it fermented it down to 005. And then another fruity yeast that I went along with in the same wort stopped at like 1014 and like wouldn't go any further. So like that one does not care. It fermented uh, 1087 down to like 005 and made it 11 percent. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So you're not, you're not finding if you're you're getting beers that tend to be super high or super dry. Um, you're, you're finding some of the yeah. Some like I said, that other yeast stopped at 1014, but uh, the ones that have Brettanomyces definitely go down. I have one. I tried to make like a six percent beer and. Uh, got higher efficiency than expected, so I'm like, oh, it's gonna be seven, and then that fermented it down to like 0 0.992, and it was like 9%. It was amazing. <laughs> Anyone else? So, you and I talked about fruit flies at one point, 
What do you think about fruit flies? I think fruit flies are a really good way to get acetic acid bacteria. <laughs> so if you want to make vinegar, uh, some fruit flies in a start. <laughs> nice. But I mean, yeah, you could try and like keep oxygen away from it and see if you get anything other than acetic acid bacteria. Yeah. But I don't know, I feel like that might be a waste of time. Yeah. But I don't know. Three months ago, I would have thought throwing a wasp into the starter would have been a waste of time. So, <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about keeping oxygen away from stuff? Have you ever gone as far as to like actually burn your vessel with CO2 before you put stuff in? I have not, but you definitely could. That's a great way to keep some oxygen out. But you do want that starter to have some oxygen for the yeast to be able to reproduce. <clears throat> I made a, a, a starter out of peaches, and I was really worried about mold, and so I did burn it, and I got great results. Cool. Last chance. Well, I, it's not a com it's not a question, but more of a comment. Uh, I actually made a yeast starter out of packets of sugar at work and cherries that somebody brought in in a mason nice. jar. Awesome. And it totally fermented it down to like, you know, nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Matt, how many of your yeast came from within a bottle of your house? Um, I don't know. I kind of consider most of them all to be kind of the same. Um, like that honey yeast. I also got some from some wild grapes I noticed while walking the dog. Um, I got some from a plum blossom off my plum tree, and I got some that I just, uh, when I was brewing one day, I just let the mash tun slowly drip out into a thing like this. And then at the end of the brew day, like four or five hours later, I just dumped it into a growler and put an airlock on it to see if anything would grow, and uh, it did. So. Um, but those are all, they're all taste very similar. So I think it's just kind of that indigenous yeast that lives around my area. But mine, you said, is different than yours. Mm -hmm. And I live, what, about six miles away? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. if, you know, you might get something at a relative's house or a friend's house that's not too far from your house. It could be a completely different type of culture. So, yeah, for your sure. experience is that around your house, one yeast seems to be Seems to be least. dominant, or at least that maybe it's a culture of... I don't, I really don't know because I haven't had it analyzed or done anything, so. Do you make a habit of dumping your slurry somewhere outside to try and change the yeast in your area? Uh, I usually just, uh, if I'm not going to save that slurry, I'll just put it in my compost. So I haven't tried to like culture anything from my compost, so. <laughs> if you want Brett, go to his house, especially yeah. his basement. <laughs> Just go in wear your clothes and then come back and just dance around your shop for five minutes and you'll have bread and everything. <laughs> <laughs> There's already bread in your house. Yep. Even if you didn't bring it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. I'm going to do some work. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Matt. <laughs>